up, up to you first. So listen, listen carefully. Okay. But um, I, so again, this transitions to our, our first question to kind of warm things up a little bit. So we are all alike in the sense that our uh, career paths have unfolded uniquely, teaching us uh, valuable, ooh, valuable skill sets along the way. So, so Seth, my first question is gonna be for all three of you is, you know, what would you say about your background lends itself well to your role in innovation? Yeah, so in addition to just having experience, um, having done innovation work in the enterprise um, and consulted enterprises as well from the outside, um, I think mostly it's the fact that um, a lot of my work has been about gathering data historically around where things are going. So that's where the futurism comes in. It's not about assessing and, and prophesying and saying this is exactly what will happen on this day but it's about understanding and having foresight to what's on the horizons and where things are most plausible. Where's the market going? All of those kind of things. And uh, a lot of that stems from the fact that I just believe that all businesses are constantly in motion and that motion requires innovation. So you can't sleep on uh, what got you success yesterday. You have to constantly change and you can't change for just the sake of change, it's gotta be meaningful. So that perspective, that vision, and a, a whole series of experiences that have constantly reinforced um, and reiterated those opportunities, I think is why this work is so interesting and compelling and why I can't get out of it, so. That, that's great. So I'm, again, all to all three of you, um, Callie, same question. So what would you say about your background really lends itself to working in this innovative space? Yeah, for sure. Um, I would say my background in consulting. So the fact that I've worked with a huge variety of clients um, across industries, across roles, um, and I myself have been a little bit of a jack of all trades. Um, you know, I think a lot of people encounter, do I go broad in my career? Do I go deep and build that expertise? And I've always chosen breadth um, and or breadth has always found me I don't know um, but again you know coming up from program management client success delivery um, sales I've just had kind of a really wide array of roles myself with a wide array of different teams and I think that's exposed me to a lot of um, variation in ways of thinking um, culturally as well as what drives end users what drives um, you know inside selling all of these things that we realistically need to make sure we're speaking to when we think about innovation. Yeah, Megan. Okay, so the answer is I don't know. I feel I feel like um, trying to describe why you can do innovation is like if somebody asks you like why you're cool. Like cool people don't know that they're cool and they never tell other people they're cool. So like. I'm an innovator because other people tell me I am, but I don't think of myself as like, I'm going to wake up in the morning and innovate. I think it's just about connecting dots, being willing to tell stories, and sometimes having the courage to suggest something that seems stupid or silly, and to not be offended if the idea doesn't go anywhere, like to not associate that with like your own worth. And I think some of that comes with time, right? Like getting the breadth of career experience. Um, but my, I initially went to school to be a copywriter. I thought I would go into advertising and be a creative. And my dad was a copywriter. And one thing that he told me was, the way to be a good copywriter is to not read ads. Read everything else. And that's what informs really good copy. And I took that and really applied it to everything. So the way to be good at something is to not just study that thing. It's to study all of the other interesting things in the world because you're going to pull ideas from seemingly unrelated areas. That it, Such great perspective from all three of you. Again, it's the unique background that leads us whether we know it think it, whatever, that it just kind of brings us to our position. So Megan, kind of building on something that you said. So uh, uh, across our work at Nerdery, a common theme that we hear from clients is, is that they don't often know where to start with their innovative work, whether that's figuring out how to cement the idea or building that business case. Can you speak to your process of, of how you've accomplished like nailing down an idea or figuring out where to start? So I think 
in the work that my team does, we always start with two ingredients. And one is, what is the business need or the business objective or the business opportunity? And the other is, what is the customer need or objective or desire? Because innovation, at least in our business, comes from when those two things come together, when there's some kind of positive business result that also meets a customer need or exceeds their expectation or makes them wildly happy. So the first place that we always start is if we don't understand the customer need, it's understanding that. And then exploring, is there a way to meet this customer need in a way that also achieves the business objective or pushes us into a new opportunity? And vice versa. Sometimes ideas come from the business where we think we want to do something and we have to validate, well, do customers actually want that thing? And so I think a big part of innovation that people don't talk about as much because it's not as fun is when you explore ideas and then you're like, you know what, we shouldn't do that. And I think as a as you're thinking about innovation in an organization, it's very important to be able to tell the story to your leaders about the money you helped the organization not spend on ideas that were not worth pursuing. Because without that story, that work is invisible and people tend to latch on to the ideas that actually catch fire and turn into something, but that's maybe one out of every 10 ideas you have. So I've worked hard in my team to help visualize to our leaders, here's some work that we did, and the result of that work was we did nothing. High five, good job everybody, we did not do that because that's not something customers were interested in, or customers are really interested, but there's not really a strong business case for us there. That's great. So uh, Callie, kind of broadening that. So ar articulating innovative ideas is is often then the next step. So we've, we've maybe starting to hone in on, um, uh, here is our idea. They're getting to that process, right? Um, often folks need to communicate the, that story, just as Megan was saying. They need to communicate the story of their vision and value before they have anything tangible, right? So I got an idea, but I need to talk about it, but I have nothing tangible from which to, to kind of continue those conversations. So in, in these instances, what maybe has been proven effective for you when it comes to gaining some alignment and buy-in around conceptual ideas? Um, I love this question. It's kind of story of my life, especially today, literally this business day. Um, no, so I think that there's there are definitely a few tactical things you can do to support that. But I think first and foremost, um, one thing I found to be really meaningful is building um, relationships and collaboration and alignment before you're at that stage. Um, I know that's not helpful if you're already there panicking, but um, one thing I've seen be really effective within my teams is making sure that we do have that upfront collaboration, meet and greets, shaking hands, kissing babies. You want your other you know, collaborators, whether that's other departments in your work environment, whether that's customers or their end customers, to know who you are before you're coming to them with an ask. Um, building that trust, having that kind of validity, that legitimization ahead of the curve. And then um, it kind of serves as a little bit of an organic groundswell. So as you're building those relationships, you're hearing from other, you know, sales teams who are engaged with your end customers. Hey, you know, I am hearing these rumblings or I'm hearing that customers are really looking to solve this one problem that no one has solved yet. As that data starts to kind of, you know, collect with whether that's your team or even a higher tier than that, Suddenly, it's more than one or two people saying something. It's multiple people. You're able to start identifying some of those themes. Um, and then you're, start, you're able to start building out that case, um, whether those are true business models, use cases, et cetera, or whether it's at least some tangential you know, direction you can take to your leadership. So I found that to be super valuable. Yeah, Seth, I'm going to have you help build on that a little bit. So again, like what's kind of proven effective for you in, the, in that buy-in space. And, and some fun facts about Seth. He has um, started six companies and sold four of them. So in that process, Seth, like if you are able to kind of ground that a little bit for us and maybe like some type of career highlight, uh, actual execution opportunity, uh, anything that kind of compels you, you want to speak to in, in a little bit more depth there. Yeah, so for me personally, I, I don't have any challenges coming up with ideas. That's not the challenge. I think to Megan's point, it's about saying no nine out of 10 times um, and getting to know as quickly as possible. Uh, our My optimization from a career standpoint is about learning 
how to shorten the time to know um, as much as you can. But when you finally get that idea, that opportunity, and you're transitioning from idea to concept, which I think is an important stage, which is you're starting to build a plan. You, you grounded it in both a business need and a consumer need, just like Megan talked about. And in addition to that, you start to have those early connection points. I understand the problem very clearly. I think that's the most important part in the early concept phase. Solutions will shift and change. You'll pivot and make adjustments. But what's necessary, I believe, for success, whether you're starting a new company or transforming inside of an enterprise, is a very in-depth understanding of the problem space. And being able to articulate what that current landscape looks like and what those challenges are. And Kelly talked about relationships and, and I will just second that and say that oftentimes those relationships, um, not only are the, they colleagues and peers and you know individuals in leadership, but ideally I like to go and get conversations and relationships with the individuals in the organization that have that problem. So if we're talking about a problem that's in a warehouse and it happens to be um, a warehouse worker specifically on a receiving end of the dock, then I'm looking to build those relationships and get the, the quotes, the testimonials, the words directly from their mouth so that as we're having conversations going forward, it's not my perspective, but it's a deep understanding in both qualitative and quantitative. And so from an experience standpoint, um, I started a company a few years ago. It was a joint venture. So I got uh, two enterprises. One was the incumbent in the industry in transportation and logistics. And then the other was a technology first organization. And those two organizations came together. They funded a solution. And um, I founded this, this new company. And I got the, to go from idea all the way through execution and eventual acquisition as well. And uh, the goal was disrupt the industry that the incumbent uh, was in, totally change it and, and bring a new customer experience. Um, and so in that process of getting early buy-in and having those conversations, we were in the field as much as possible so that when we came back, we had that experience. Um, we also looked at 2,200 startups in the space. So I'm a huge believer in doing your research and oftentimes the traditional competitors that you know aren't the companies that are going to provide the themes, trends, and understanding you'll need to provide a truly innovative solution. So we always did something, we, I call it the disruptive threat index, but we essentially will look at hundreds or thousands of companies in the startup space because they have the most innovative ideas and concepts. And they're often going to give you a three to five year perspective on what themes and trends will be most valuable in the enterprise uh, because they've got a head start. So I pull all that data together and uh, jokingly, I always say, I just kind of beat, beat people over the head with, with data information and insights. And uh, it's super effective. Yeah, Seth, something um, I'm going to pull out of a, a earlier comment that you made. So my next question is about kind of building the right team to do this kind of work. So again, you've you've kind of been involved in a number of different businesses and industries over the years, and and um, you yourself having worn a lot of hats across consulting. But I I think we can all agree that uh, we can't do this ourselves. Although we might try, it's it's not something that we as individuals can can ex execute upon. So what has uh, in your experience a successful team or partnership makeup kind of look like? Who you bring into the table? Yeah, so people are at the heart of innovation. Um, oftentimes, when we think about team, we a lot of times say innovation, and then we go straight to technology. And technology is just a mirror of the business. Like it's it it is going to be the output of processes, and processes are the output of team or it's teams and individuals. So if you get the people wrong, you're going to have poor processes, and it doesn't matter if you're on the latest platform, framework, or emerging technology, it will just mirror broken processes that come from the wrong perspectives or the wrong environment. So from a team standpoint, I think alignment around vision is really critical. It doesn't mean everyone agrees. 
I think you have to intentionally build uh, scenarios where teams can disagree and have controversial conversations on a regular basis, um, but they do have to be able to commit and move forward and they should be complementary. So I'm a more visionary individual who comes up with lots of concepts and I like to start the fire of innovation, but I know that I need integrators and individuals that can carry that flame forward and are very operationally minded or have different skill sets. And so you have to build a diverse team who understand the business problems and the customer problems in an intimate and personal way. And I think another thing in my mind that I always look for is it's important to say no to bad ideas, but it's really critical that most people, once you've all agreed on an idea and in a concept and you've built the plan, everyone has to say yes first. And so it's, yes, we can figure this out. Yes, we can do this. Yes, there's you know an opportunity here. Um, and then you've got to drive forward until those no's become obvious uh, to the team in, in those conversations. But there's a shift that has to happen between no's and yeses, I believe, because you have to be committed to keep driving until you've pivoted your way into the right solution. Yeah. Yeah. That point back to alignment is it, it, crucial. Uh, Megan, I'm going to ask the same question kind of to you in, in your space at, at Best Buy or back to clockwork, whichever, whichever experience you want to pull from. But uh, what has building a successful team like looked like over your career? Yeah. I, to build on what Seth said, I think um, a diverse team is really important. Um, diversity in skills, diversity in life experience, and you have to create the most important thing is that everybody is aligned to the same why. So if we're all bought into like why we're doing this, then it's much easier for us to have healthy disagreements about how we're going to actually get there. And to Seth's point, like if you have everybody in the room who's like, yes, this is great. I have no feedback. Like that is you're probably in the midst of a disaster and you just don't see it. So as the person who is the leader of that team or the leader of the innovation, the, all the data that we've talked about is really important, but you have got to be able to tell a story about that innovation that like lights a fire in people's hearts because you're gonna go through some really difficult times as the team that's pulling off the innovation, but also for the people, like at some point your team is gonna have to let go of that thing and someone else is gonna have to carry it forward. So I always think about that initial story as like it has to create enough momentum for that idea to keep continuing long after I have had to let go of that idea. And so it's really important that everybody in that room who's in that first room is all aligned on like we're here to accomplish something together and the reason i'm disagreeing with you is because we want to get this thing done and i'm worried that this decision isn't going to get us there and then it's not about it's a personal thing i'm attacking you i'm telling your idea is dumb we're wrestling with the ideas on the table we're not fighting with each other as individuals so i think it takes a lot of um it takes a lot of cultivating an environment of psychological safety. Like it's really easy to be like, hey guys, we should all like disagree. But if you're disagreeing with your boss and you're the breadwinner of your family, like there, there are risks you don't wanna take. And so innovation, for everybody on the innovation team, innovation is like fun. For everybody else, it means change. They do not want to do it. So you have to like you have to create this environment where you're pressure testing the hell out of your idea and you're creating a story about that idea that gets other people excited about it. And Callie mentioned the importance of also getting other people to buy in. Like how fun is it when someone walks into your life and is like, "You know what? I got the solution for you." got a great idea. It's going to fix your life. You're like, get out of here. So, but it's different if I'm like, Hey, I noticed you're struggling with that thing. Like, let's come up with a solution together. And so that, that is what this is all about. And there's that phrase that everybody loves to throw around about 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's like Ben Franklin or some old white guy. Um, I am convinced that that 99% perspiration is just the 87,000 conversations you are going to have to have with other people about this idea. 
So you better love it and it better be a good story because you're going to be a one hit wonder for a while while you perform that story over and over and over again to try to get people bought into it. I have no idea if I answered your question. I just sort of went no. off. He, I, and I wasn't going to stop. Great. It's a good thing for coming out. <laughs> Can I just no, add, I, like ooh. to that point, um, I, the way I've always thought about it is like 20% of your innovation work is the program itself, the product, the thing you're building. And to Megan's point, like 80% of that is change management, campaigning. Like I literally build like a political campaign and document who's the no's, who's the yeses, who's the maybes. And um, most of my work in that process is not senior leadership. I think it's easier to get a C-suite member or an executive or the board to align to a vision. And it's easier to get the people that are in the heart of the problem your real issue is middle management. They have the most to lose in change and when those things happen, and you have to spend the time there with them because they get the problem, but they have a lot personally invested in, in the change itself. And if you don't target the middle management as a core area um, for that campaigning and that storytelling and that persuasive work, I think no matter how great your idea, you're you're gonna have challenges actually yeah. getting executed. No, you're you're spot on, Seth. And I know something my team and across nerdery that we we talk about here is the idea of co-creation. And that that it, that's both sides, both where you know someone like Nerdery coming in to help support your organization, really challenge you in unique ways. But that that's internal as well, bringing from business to IT to the table huge success. And again, if you approach it in that mindset of let's, we're in this together, we're building it together. I think you establish more of that empathy. You get that buy-in and hopefully smoother sale, not perfect all the time, but it, it at least is a, um, a better place from which to start. So Megan, I'm coming back to you. So in this mindset, I'm, you said so many good things I'm going to come back to, but I'm semi trying to build a story here, you know, trying to do a job. Um, so we, <laughs> we've, we've built the right team. We have the right partners. Um, Something we haven't talked about yet is, is so next we, we need to go uh, figure out how we're going to go about getting funding. So how are we actually going to move this I idea forward? It usually takes some dollars behind that. So can you touch on any um, experience you've had or how you've approached securing funding to help ensure some of your initiatives are getting the green light once you've got the idea, you know the alignment and your right team is ready to roll? So I think it comes back again to the story. Like you have to tell a good story that gets somebody to say, not only do I believe in that idea, I believe in that idea so much, I'm willing to give you money to pursue that idea. Um, and so it's really just about how do you prove either that this is worth investing in because we're gonna learn something from it, or it's worth investing in because the chances that we're going to have some sort of business result that we're looking for will come from this idea. Seth mentioned earlier, like the importance of like quotes, like the more you can really humanize the story you're telling and say, this is how it's going to affect the actual person who's going to use this product. This is the pain that our customer is feeling that we're going to fix with this innovation, or this is the pain that our internal employees are feeling that we will improve by changing this. Again, going back to this point that like, when you are the innovator, like you're on a really fun ride, everybody on the outside is just like, why are you changing things? I don't like it. And so you have to like find a way to understand their motivations, their point of view, and you have to be able to craft your story. I loved the analogy of a political campaign. Like you have to be able to help somebody understand why they want to come into it. I sometimes describe it as like a charm offensive. You just have to like, you're really trying to woo people into your idea. And if you just come in like, I know everything and I'm going to tell you how to fix everything, you immediately turn people off. But if you're inviting somebody into something with you, that's a different story. And if you can get them to understand what's in it for them, that's also super important, particularly if it's internal innovation and you're asking somebody to give you internal budget you have to be able to say, so that's one of the first questions I ask myself if I'm walking into a meeting is, if I'm on their side of the table, what's in it for me? And am I answering that question? Yeah, yeah that's great. Ka Callie, from your perspective, it's a similar question. I'll maybe tap at a, a little different angle, but um, you know, when it, sometimes these outside of the box ideas, like it takes, again, 
I appreciate, love the idea of like how we're articulating this and telling that story. But um, has there any, has there been a time that you had to get like extra creative and how you sought funding again, whether from an, an internal or client facing um, experience that you've had in your consulting work over the years? Yeah, for sure. So plus one to everything Megan said. I mean, the storytelling is key. Um, storytelling is hard, I've found in my experience, because the person sitting across from you might love your story. They might be totally aligned. And then they go, I don't know how to tell a story to my boss. How do I do this? You made it sound so great, I don't understand. Um, and that's where I like to bring in a data layer. I'm a data kind of gal, I love a good spreadsheet. Um, but really that kind of land and expand approach. I like to make sure that we're tracking our work and we're getting credit for our work. And that might mean that, you know, again, in my role in client success, it means we're saying, hey, the amount of money you just spent was worth X, Y, Z. And here's a literal tie to that return um, that you got your potential growth. Here's how we're continuing to evolve and expand um, ongoing business cases. And then you start to build, again, that repertoire, that trust, and that track record of tangible you know, elements that a story might not always cover, or depending on your audience, might not be quite enough. Um, so then as you start to look forward and you develop that track record, you're able to commit a little bit more strongly on a data basis for what you can promise next quarter, next year, um, within a three-year roadmap, for example. And again, you're building a little bit of that legitimacy um, and that additional buy-in, so. Yeah, no, that that's great. Different perspectives and, and all kind of layering on top of each other. So, um, Callie, this is for you. Megan touched on this before, but again, now I appreciate like a, a different lens perspective from from maybe your side. So, in this innovative, innovative space, um, we really, want to focus on like learning quickly, right? We want to test ideas, help um, to help make informed decisions and, and like build towards that larger vision. We look at the desirability, feasibility, the other viability. I, I, I went off script and then when you do that, you're like, shoot, which ability am I missing? All of the abilities. As we look at those, um, sometimes the outcome of that is to make the choice to abandon adoption. And I, I really like, I, I, love to keep, remind um, people of that because sometimes we get too committed and like this, is, I'm in it to win it and we get blindsided by that. So has there been a time that you've had to make the, oh, she's laughing. She's got a story. Um, can you tell us about a time that you've had to kind of make the decision to, to um, leave something on the kind of that cutting room floor? Yeah, I'm actually laughing because it's, it's really hard for me to think of one. Oh, ah. um, <laughs> no, um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit thematically to that. I think, um, it's it's obviously a very common occurrence and actually um part of you know our innovation studio is failing quickly and it's critical to the success of um the horizon studio that we don't pursue a sunken cost fallacy i think you've probably all had it you're trying to clear out your closet and you're keeping that sweater because you paid for it um even though it makes you feel bad every time you look at it so um you know i think it's it's again a little bit of that cultural aspect that I think we've spoken to here, where as a team, it's not that so-and-so's idea failed, or it's not that this team failed or this initiative failed. It's that as an entire ship trying to cross the Atlantic, we're not gonna Titanic this just because we told New York we'd get in a day early. Um, so really kind of taking in that big picture, again, a little bit of that psychological safety and just remembering that um, it's critical that we all make it across to enable our work and sometimes that means letting go. Yeah. It, it, are there any moments like where you take those lessons learned and applied forward? Like what what is what is what is the learning from that? And how do you you know kind of again maybe not the next idea is always going to be the one that's going forward, but how is um, do you have any experience from that building and kind of again um, helping to validate or or um, dequalify ideas sooner? For sure. So actually, um, a recent you know venture that. Um, we we chose to table for a while was literally, you know, Megan, what you referred to where, shoot, we thought the user problem was this and that our business benefit was this. And it turns out we misinterpreted that user problem. And it's not big enough to meet that business benefit. And we can't quite find enough space for there to be the kind of momentum or next step that continues to support that equation. So 
And I, I think that applies on everything from one tiny feature in a product backlog, for instance, to an entire venture or an entire startup. I'm sure Seth, you know, might have a few stories there. But um, the equation changes. And again, it's really easy to either stuff that down and think something will change or, you know, be so bought in and everyone has said yes. And we've worked 80% of our time you know, nights and weekends to get this done and to walk away from it and move to the next thing can be really hard. So again, taking that lesson of how often are we checking in on that equation? And is that a part of our culture? Is it a part of our road mapping and planning and strategy sessions to be able to say, how often are we going back and checking that the assumptions or the original equation are still accurate? And it's not always that you'll abandon it, but it might need a pivot or it might need a reconsideration of maybe the end user maybe you have the wrong segment, or maybe there are even additional opportunities. It's not always, now it's time to abandon. Now it's something like, this $3 million idea might be a $300 million idea. And because we're not re-examining those initial considerations, we might be missing out on those opportunities too. That's great. So, oh, absolutely. So um, I love that framing, because I think it comes down to like on a regular basis, just asking yourself and your team, is this still true? And if something is no longer true, it, it, it shifted in some way, that helps you frame up why the approach needs to change. So it may not be that it was a bad idea. It was a good idea with the information we had at the time, but this is no longer true. So now we're like, it would be a bad idea to continue down that path. And I think like finding a way to tell that story and to constantly check in and say, is this still true? Like I look back at like spectacular public failures and which I never want to make fun of because like there, but for the grace of God go I, but like something like Quibi, right? Huge launch of this, you know, product that on its face seemed like a good idea. Like everybody's going to want to watch these little bite-sized videos. Like everyone's going to love it. Something about that idea no longer was true, whether it was the pandemic and the fact that like we had nothing but time for a while. Like, I don't know what it was, but like, I think that's a really important part of the process is to be revisiting and saying, is this still true? what is still true and what has changed because it might stop your idea or it might bring your idea to a huge new level that you hadn't imagined six months ago. Yeah, and I think um, very tactically, so one of the critical elements of my role in customer success is validating it also in the field. Like we might have one customer where we deploy and it's amazing and we're getting all of this growth. We're getting, um, we're seeing revenue targets that meet or exceed goals. And you go to the next customer and it is not the case. They have a different segment or they have different processes to consider. So that feedback loop, um, you know, making sure that we're tracking adequate and realistic um, analytics or business data aligned to how their business operates, how their end users function. And then tying that back into A, developing our product, right? Expanding that user base that we can easily and seamlessly serve out of the box. But then B, that we're actually getting that success from that customer to feed our own engine of growth and expansion with them. Yeah, that, that's great. Seth, I, I have to assume you have an opinion about this too. It's a clearly a passion point. So I'm gonna, I'm, I want you to answer that, but I'm gonna give you a two-parter. Cause I also wanna think about, about the flip side. And, and I know this is the question for you. So um, maybe speak to a point where you've, you know, had to abandon um, an idea, but on the flip side of that, when is an opportunity that you've really challenged the status quo and saw some really unexpected and positive outcomes? So, so hit that two parts for me. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I always think of when I, when in talking about saying no to ideas or, or, or recognizing when things aren't working and you have to have those pivots, um, at the very beginning of any of the things that we turn into concepts past just ideas, which are very loose and it's a lot of organizing those kind of things. At that stage of concept, we, we're building out OKRs and KPIs and outcomes that we're trying to get to that are positive. But I'm a strong believer in the fact that you also have to have stage gates for when things are no longer viable. And you have to clearly have articulated at the beginning, if with these things are happening, we are going to either A, make a change or two, terminate the project. Like you have to know when to say no, because when you're going through the storytelling process, I know I find myself in this, I start buying the story so much. I'm so excited and so is the team and everyone's so excited, it becomes my favorite thing. 
And it's really hard to end something if you've gotten to that stage and you don't have clear, clear direction when you were less emotionally attached at how and when you'll shut those things down so that you can reallocate resources to something that will be more successful or a new method. And I, I've seen that happen again and again. I was working with um, one of the largest retailers um, and I lived in Arkansas for a long time. And um, in the process of this, they were always, uh, they always said, we don't get out of bed for problems that are not a billion dollars in size. And so you had to tell a very particular story of, of scale. And then number two, the, the other thing that they always got pushed on was they were constantly worried about some particular rivals that they had um, and whether they had the technology or not to do that. Um, and we found that oftentimes they had traditional solutions available to them that would easily solve the problem they were going after, but sometimes they made it more complicated by trying to get to certain technical or channel outcomes rather than reaching their customer or solving a problem through something as unsexy as email. Um, so when it comes to making those decisions on the, on the other side, right, like throwing yourself all in, recognizing that you're, you've got something really challenging, um, I, I would say even just the, the last experience uh, that I had when I was at uh, Handled, which is a, it was a moving company, a startup, it was corporate joint venture. So, you know, day one, we kicked off, we had a $12 million investment, uh, which is a great way to start a company. It's not always how it works for sure. Um, and we were hitting all of our goals. So we were hitting revenue targets. We went from four cities to 121 cities in a nine month period in terms of rollout. So our go to market strategies were, were all firing. And um, as we went through this process, the pandemic hit, which was really challenging from a moving perspective. So moving is this complicated emotional experience. Uh, it's the event that happens actually in the middle of a relocation. It's not the end, right? There's the settling in and you have this strange relationship with people because they're coming into your house and there aren't very many people you invite into your closet uh, to go through your underwear drawer, right? Like, but movers do, like they, they get into everything because they're trying to help you relocate to this new place. So when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden we were concerned, okay, everything we're on track for is just gonna disappear because who's gonna move in the pandemic? And we recognized a couple opportunities um, in particular and my board um, and investors, they said, we've just gotta wait this out. We gotta see how this is gonna work. Um, and it was a, pretty contentious moment, but the data had shown that if we pivoted what we were doing, uh, that we could have a, a significant opportunity in spite of COVID. And so we actually shifted our entire model. We built in a 48 hour period, we built this new app and, and released it. So it was a ridiculous turnaround that had happened because we had built the right infrastructure. Um, and then we went out and sold in a business to business fashion services to universities who had a, essentially abandoned their students in their dorm rooms and all their stuff. And we went from, we're not sure if we're gonna be a business in 60 days and I'm gonna to have to let 60 people go and go through this really hard thing um, to hitting our numbers for the entire year in a month and a half. And it was really complicated to get there, um, but, our leadership team and the rest of our organization was so committed to our individual why, which was helping the world feel at home, that we were gonna do everything possible. And that belief drove us to do things that our board and our, and our investors and other people in the industry were like, not possible, won't happen. You can't go fast enough to take advantage of this opportunity. Um, but we did, because we were aligned. And that was really critical. Can I add to that? Okay, Mike working. So I think Seth is hitting on something super important here, which is that something I've noticed about innovation is that the pace is really slow until it's really fast. And so an example from my world is in 
actually 2016, 2017, my team started looking into alternative fulfillment options for customers at Best Buy. And so we had done a pilot of lockers. Customers seemed to really like them. And the question was like, hey, should we scale these up and just like put lockers at every Best Buy? Customers seemed to seem to like it. So we broadened that question and we said, well, lockers are one option. Um, there's other options like curbside or maybe lockers that aren't at our store that are somewhere else. So we came up with these conceptual ideas. We did all kinds of customer testing and it turned out that customers were like, yeah, I like those lockers, but you know what I like even more is I like curbside pickup. That's pretty sweet. And so it was like a two year process of research and designing. And then in 2019 holiday season, we piloted curbside pickup in a few Best Buy locations. And customers loved it. And we were like, yeah, we'll, we'll probably like eventually scale that up. And then like March 2020, again, going back to like this alignment on the why, we as an organization were like number one priorities is keep customers safe, keep employees safe. So when the pandemic happened, we closed all of our stores. And then within the course of less than a week, we rolled out curbside to every single Best Buy. And so for a period of, of many weeks, that was your only option for getting products and people were using it like crazy. And so it's just fascinating to me that there is this, there tends to be this cycle where you're going to invest in this long and slow process, then something happens and you pivot and you end up using all of that knowledge that you built up over the last two years and you often will end up executing it in a totally different way than you initially imagined. Um, so I just, that really struck me because I think that is not uncommon. It's like slow, 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 meet, let's have another meeting guys. Let's like talk about it, let's tell the story. And then all of a sudden you're like, bam, everybody's getting it. Like, yes. Um, I think some of that flexibility needs to happen in the innovative space as well, right? Um, test, experiment, react to. And I think if you approach it with too constrained of a mindset, like all it can only work this way, that's your, your response to the pandemic might not have been successful. Had you not been open to like, how can we bend this, flex this, turn this, twist it to apply in a slightly different use case than we've set out to. So great, great example there.